On April 6, 1994, diving legend Shaq attempted to break the diving depth record in the Zaka Tony sinkhole, but something went terribly wrong. This is his story. On June 29, 1968, Shaq and his brother Edward arrived at one of their favorite swimming spots, Wakula Springs, about 14 miles south of Tallahassee, Florida. It was a scorching summer day, and the springs offered a refreshing escape. However, Shaq and Edward weren't just there for a casual swim. At only 19, Shaq had already made a name for himself in the local diving community, earning a reputation as a diving prodigy. Locals spoke of Shaq with awe, describing him as a legend. They claimed he could make an air tank last longer than anyone else and dive to depths that would make the average diver faint. Stories about Shaq were like fishermen's tales, growing more impressive with each retelling. His frequent dives at Wakula Springs helped solidify this mythic status. Signs at Wakula Springs clearly stated that scuba diving was strictly prohibited, so Shaq and Edward resorted to free diving to test their limits. They would take turns seeing how deep they could dive on a single breath before the urge for air forced them to rush back to the surface. That day, Shaq was eager to test a new piece of equipment, a wrist-worn depth gauge. This would provide official measurements for their free diving competitions. After easing into the warm waters of Wakula Springs, Shaq and Edward swam to the deeper areas. They took turns diving with the depth gauge, each trying to outdo the other. Shaq always let Edward go first, and each time his brother surfaced, Shaq would dive a little deeper. When Edward recorded a depth of 42 feet, Shaq came back with a reading of 50 feet. Determined to surpass his younger brother, Edward took several deep breaths before diving again, pushing himself further than ever. Shaq watched as Edward descended, realizing he had gone deeper than either of them had ever ventured without scuba gear. But as Edward turned to ascend, he suddenly went limp and began sinking. Shaq immediately dove to reach his brother, but Edward was unconscious and kept sinking deeper. Despite his best efforts, Shaq couldn't reach him without scuba equipment. Desperate, Shaq swam to the beach, grabbed an air tank from his car but collapsed from exhaustion after multiple attempts to rescue Edward on a single breath. Fortunately, a nearby swimmer noticed Shaq's distress, grabbed his dive gear and dove to rescue Edward. The swimmer found Edward's limp body at the bottom of Wakula Springs. There was still a slim chance he could be saved. After pulling Edward to the surface and getting him onto the beach, Shaq began CPR in front of a growing crowd. Edward had been underwater far longer than most could survive, but miraculously Shaq managed to get him breathing again. At that point, an ambulance arrived and rushed Edward to the nearest hospital, where he was placed on life support. Tragically, he was taken off it later that night when it became clear that he had no brain activity. This was devastating for Shaq. From that moment, he dedicated his life to establishing diving safety standards and protocols. This was his way of coping with the grief and ensuring that no other parents would have to suffer the same pain his parents did. Over the next 26 years, Shaq's dedication to diving safety became an obsession. He also developed a passion for a specialized type of diving, cave diving. The first time Shaq entered an underwater cave, he was instantly captivated. At that time, cave diving was a new activity without much training or safety standards. Shaq quickly became one of the foremost experts in the field. In 1979, he published a book called Basic Cave Diving, a blueprint for survival, which is still considered the definitive guide for the sport. The book primarily focuses on safety and emergency procedures. Beyond writing, Shaq became one of the most experienced cave divers ever. By the age of 23, he had already completed over 100 cave dives, and by his mid-40s that number had grown to over 4,000. While Shaq loved increasing his dive count, it was extreme depth diving that truly brought out the competitor in him. He seemed to have a unique ability to withstand the pressures of deep diving. The deeper a diver goes, the greater the risks become. The crushing pressure of the water can squeeze anything not built to withstand it, similar to an empty water bottle being compressed. Depth also has various effects on the human body. Conditions like nitrogen narcosis and decompression sickness, also known as the bends, can set in quickly and without much warning. As a diver goes deeper, nitrogen builds up in the bloodstream faster than the body can absorb it, leading to a narcotic effect similar to being drunk. Severe nitrogen narcosis can cause hallucinations, dizziness, and unconsciousness, 
all of which are extremely dangerous hundreds of feet underwater. To combat these dangers, divers use different gas mixtures with less nitrogen than regular air as they go deeper. Shaq's remarkable abilities to handle these extreme conditions made him a legend in the diving community. Interestingly, Shaq seemed to have an almost immunity to narcosis. While supporting two divers attempting to break the air-only depth record in 1970, Shaq made it to 465 feet before experiencing any effects of narcosis. Sadly, the two divers he was assisting did not share his resistance and died during the attempt. Shaq was also the first person to dive below 800 feet in technical scuba diving, a feat attempted by only 20 people in history as of 2021. Despite his near immunity to narcosis, Shaq never experienced decompression sickness, also known as the bends. Decompression sickness occurs when nitrogen absorbed during descent floods back into the bloodstream too quickly, creating bubbles. The best way to prevent the bends is by making decompression stops during ascent. The number and duration of these stops depend on the depth and duration of the dive. By stopping at specific depths for a set amount of time, the nitrogen is released slowly, preventing the formation of large bubbles. Having resistance to these conditions was a significant advantage for Shaq. By 1994, he held three of the deepest dive records. He had even broken his own record by diving 881 feet a few years earlier, but he believed he could go even further, and he needed the right place to do it. Around this time, Shaq's friend and diving partner, Jim Bowden, told him about a place with the deepest known sinkhole in the world, Zaka Tome. This cave is technically a sinkhole called a cenote, similar to a blue hole, but found inland. In 1993, Shaq visited Zakatome himself. Shaq's excitement was palpable. Despite being a typically calm math teacher, he was like a kid on Christmas morning after resurfacing from his first dive at Zakatome. Immediately, he and Jim began meticulously planning a dive that would take them beyond a thousand feet. For the next year, they scrutinized every detail. Perfection was the goal. They calculated the gas blend and quantity needed for the dive, conducting numerous practice dives to ensure they were both physically and mentally prepared for the challenge. Their meticulous planning resulted in a solid, detailed plan. They assembled their support team, including divers Chris Beck and Marcus Gary, as well as Shaq's wife Mary Ellen and Jim's wife Karen. Instead of entering directly through Zaka Tome's tall rock faces, they opted to enter from a nearby spring and navigate a 600-foot tunnel connecting the two. Prior to the dive, ropes were set up in the sinkhole for their descent and ascent. Jim would descend first, followed by Shaq after a 10-second interval to avoid collisions. Their descent would be rapid, dropping at a rate of 100 feet per minute. This swift descent would minimize decompression time on the way up, as they planned to touch the bottom briefly before beginning their ascent. However, even a brief stay at extreme depths would necessitate hours of decompression stops during the ascent. They meticulously planned tank and regulator switches at specific depths, utilizing six different gas mixtures across over 30 tanks to mitigate narcosis and expedite decompression. Despite the precision, diving to such depths was uncharted territory. Working with a physiologist, Shaq fine-tuned the gas mixtures. Despite starting ascent slightly early upon reaching the bottom and having staggered tanks along their guide ropes, the return journey would still require approximately 10 hours and 50 stops to complete. As they ascended, the support team members positioned themselves at specific depths, ready to assist Jim during his dive. With everything meticulously planned, they set the dive date for April 6, 1994, conveniently coinciding with Shaq's 45th birthday and his spring break from teaching. However, despite being in excellent physical condition, Shaq spent much of the year contemplating his future in diving. A pivotal moment came in 1993, during a dive at Bushman's Hole in South Africa, where Shaq experienced his first real underwater scare. Attempting to reach a depth of 863 feet, he encountered the effects of high pressure nervous syndrome, HPNS, due to breathing helium at extreme depths. HPNS can cause sudden and debilitating symptoms, such as violent shaking, extreme sleepiness, changes in heart rate, 
and decreased mental functioning. Shaq began to tremble around 700 feet, with his vision distorting and his skin feeling intensely itchy. Despite his determination, Shaq's symptoms worsened, forcing him to abandon the dive at 863 feet. This experience left him shaken and questioning his pursuit of extreme depth records. He realized that he was not invincible and became acutely aware of the dangers lurking in the depths. After much contemplation, Shaq made the decision to retire from extreme depth diving after his upcoming dive at Zaka Tom. Crossing the thousand-foot threshold would serve as a fitting conclusion to his diving career, marking the end of an era. As Shaq, Jim, and the support team arrived at Zaka Tom, anticipation filled the air. News of Shaq's final record attempt had attracted the attention of several sports publications and a local TV news channel, prompting a crowd of farmers and locals to gather on the surrounding cliffs to witness the historic dive. Despite the spectators, Shaq and Jim remained focused as they entered the water and made their way through the connecting tunnel into Zaka Tom. Once inside, they closed their eyes and began to meditate, slowing their breathing to a few breaths per minute, mentally preparing for the dive ahead. At 9.45 a.m., Jim descended into the water, followed closely by Shaq. They descended using compressed air until they reached 300 feet, then switched to a gas mixture containing helium at 600 feet. As they continued their descent, Jim encountered the first problem when he started trembling involuntarily at 750 feet. Unbeknownst to him, his descent rate was faster than planned, causing him to breathe more helium than intended. As he descended further, his trembling worsened, indicating the onset of high-pressure nervous syndrome, HPNS. When he reached 900 feet, Jim checked his air gauges and realized he had consumed a significant amount of gas, much faster than anticipated. With one tank empty and the other running low, Jim knew he needed to ascend immediately to avoid running out of gas. Inflating his buoyancy device at 925 feet, he began his ascent, only to encounter another setback when the regulator on his decompression tank malfunctioned, causing gas to shoot out uncontrollably. In a desperate attempt to regain control, Jim switched the regulator to the compressed air tanks and tried to fix the malfunctioning one, but to no avail. With no other choice, he held the faulty tank under his arm and continued his ascent, manually opening and closing the valve to breathe. As Jim struggled with his equipment, the support team on the surface kept a close watch on the bubbles rising from the water. According to the plan, the bubbles should reappear within 12 to 18 minutes after disappearing indicating the diver's progress. When the bubbles resurfaced above Jim's rope but not Shaq's, the team grew concerned. One of the support divers went back to the spring to meet Jim and find out what was happening. Meanwhile, as Jim descended further, he noticed that Shaq's rope remained slack, with no movement or lights visible in the darkness below. Despite his growing panic, Jim convinced himself that Shaq was simply lagging behind. Upon reaching his next decompression stop, Jim was relieved to find the support diver waiting for him, her worry palpable as they waited together. Back on the surface, Shaq's wife, Mary Ellen, sensed something was wrong when she noticed the absence of the others. She quickly learned from Karen, Jim's wife, that Shaq might be in trouble. Without hesitation, Mary Ellen plunged into the water and made her way through the tunnel to join Jim. As she reached him, she communicated her intention to search for Shaq at the 250-foot mark, determined to find her husband. Mary Ellen reached the ledge at 250 feet, hoping to catch sight of Shaq's light, but she encountered only darkness. Descending further without the right gas, she soon realized it was too risky to continue and turned back. Karen followed her into the water, meeting her at 100 feet. As Mary Ellen attempted to ascend again, Karen noticed her tears and checked her depth gauge. Mary Ellen had descended too far and would need to decompress for 30 minutes before surfacing safely. Karen held her, offering comfort during the agonizing wait. Meanwhile, a photographer captured their emotional exit from the water, their grief palpable as they emerged. Back underwater, Jim continued his decompression, knowing Shaq was gone. The confirmation of Shaq's fate dashed any remaining hope for Jim. For hours, Jim remained suspended in the water, grappling with his thoughts. Finally, after nearly 10 hours, he surfaced alone, 
shocking those gathered. The reality sank in, and the team, along with locals, had to return to Zakatome to retrieve the equipment. As they pulled up the rope, they discovered Shaq's body at the end of it. The exact circumstances of Shaq's death remain uncertain, but one theory suggests he may have experienced a high-pressure event, leading to the loss of his regulator and eventual drowning. The circumstances surrounding Shaq's tragic passing remain shrouded in speculation, with various possibilities considered. One theory suggests that despite meticulous planning, the gas mixtures used during the dive could have been off, leading to potentially incapacitating conditions such as nitrogen narcosis, helium toxicity, or oxygen toxicity at extreme depths. Another intriguing possibility is that Shaq may have intentionally tethered himself to the rope, foreseeing the dire outcome and ensuring his body could be retrieved without endangering others. This act, if true, speaks to Shaq's selflessness and concern for the safety of his fellow divers. Despite the sorrow of his loss, Shaq's legacy lives on as a pioneer in cave diving safety standards. His dedication and contributions to the diving community are commemorated by his family, friends, and fellow divers. Shaq's final resting place alongside his brother Edward in Jacksonville, Florida, serves as a poignant reminder of their bond and shared passion for exploration. In a bittersweet turn of events, Shaq's diving partner Jim emerged from the water on that fateful day as the new world record holder for the deepest dive on a self-contained breathing apparatus. This achievement, while remarkable, serves as a poignant reminder of the risks inherent in the pursuit of extreme depths. As of 2014, the current depth record stands at an astonishing 1090 feet or 332 meters, a testament to the enduring spirit of exploration and the indelible impact of divers like Shaq on the world of underwater exploration.